Hello and welcome to day 86 of 100 Days of Tonalism. This is your painter in residence, M. Francis McCarthy. And the study we're doing today is Autumn Gold by Georgia Ness. Um, those of you following the my blog um, and uh, the videos on YouTube will be very familiar with Georgia Ness. Out of the 100 Days of Tonalism, we are doing probably I think 32 or 33 Georgian S paintings, so he comes up quite a lot, uh, mostly because he's so great. Anyway, um, in the last several uh, videos, we've been reading from the book Georgian S by Nikolai Sikorsky Jr., and uh, we're going to continue with that today. Color had always been important for Ness. In 1852, a critic wondered how he could, quote, resign not only all nature, but even all that is most valuable in art to a tone of color, quote unquote. And the uniquely emotional power of color made it an indispensable part of the formal equipment of any artist who, like Ness, believed in expressive effect. But in the 1870s, he began to rely increasingly on color. The titles of paintings he sent to the Academy Exhibition in 1878 suggest that. Titles like The Afterglow, The Morning Sun, and The Rainbow. And in reviews of the exhibition, he was described as, quote, essentially a colorist, a luminarist, unquote. And, quote, one of the few painters we have who can be called colorists, unquote. But it is the criticism of his palette that indicates the extent to which Ines began to rely upon color. The writer who described him as essentially a colorist also felt he sacrificed pictorial form and structure to color. The one who said he was one of the few American painters who could be called a colorist also said that his colors lacked, quote, self-restraint, unquote, and that they were, quote, violent instead of dignified, loud instead of deep in color, unquote. To discipline their chromatic bumptuousness and make them more conventionally tonal, he said, they would be improved by hanging them the paintings in a smoky chimney. Clarence Cook wrote that Ines's pictures are so noisy this year that it takes a quiet hour to listen to them. At this time, Ines himself spoke of the importance of color and the exceptional demands it made. In the spring of 1878, a controversy developed over a suggestion by the painter and designer John Lafarge that wood engravers be included among the artists represented in the United States in the upcoming International Exposition in Paris. In a letter to the New York Evening Post, and that's disputed on several grounds the equality of wood engravers and with painters. The painter produces, quote, the painter produces original work, the engraver only imitates the work of others. The painter, because he works from nature, must have greater resources than the engraver. Who only reproduces an after wall. This is a direct quote here from Ines. The painter must be a colorist, the most difficult thing in the world. Where are our colorists? Every painter tries to be one, but how many of us succeed? No artist feels that he can perf that he perfectly succeeds with his color, with that which is the soul of his painting. The demands made upon a painter in this direction are so great that sometimes he feels that Almost anybody can do work in black and white, but that nobody can adequately reproduce the harmonies of nature and color. The defense of painting against wood engraving accounts for Ines's emphasis on color, which in the terms of is this composition of, is of course painting's unique attribute. But in speaking of it as, quote, the soul of painting, unquote, Ines expressed his belief in the centrality of color. And in speaking of its quote-unquote demands, he suggested that, he, that it had moved only recently to occupy this central position. Ines lived in Claude's studio in Rome and visited Titian's birthplace, both acts of homage to, one of, to two of the most renowned colorists in the history of art. Titian, it seems, was of particular interest. Reporting on Ines from Rome in 1874, a correspondent to the Boston Transcript believed that Titian, quote, greatly influenced him, as is plainly shown in the greater depth and richness of his coloring, unquote. And Ines himself thought he most resembled Titian, who, 
he believes stood at his elbow. Vanessa's interest in color in the 1870s may have been stimulated most, however, not by artistic experiences, whatever they might have been, but by something else equally important. In April 1875, the Boston Transcript announced that he was to read a paper at the Boston Art Club on, quote, the logic of the real, aesthetically considered, unquote. And in September, the transcript reported that he is, quote, engaged in writing a work on art, unquote. Ness had long had an appetite for philosophical and theological speculation. One nourished in the 1860s by Beecher Page and the teachings of Swedenborg. But this is the first indication of his serious and to, to the extent that he actually committed to paper and public speech, disciplined interest in art theory. Whatever he wrote in 1875 has not survived, but two substantial theoretical utterances that appeared a few years later, uh, one is called A Painter on Painting, published in Harper's New Monthly Magazine in 1878, and Mr. Ines on Art Matters that appeared in the Art Journal in 1879 probably contain a good deal of what he was thinking about. And we'll leave it there on page 75. Thanks for joining me today uh, for 86. We'll see you tomorrow for day 87 of 100 Days of Tonalism. Uh, if you would like to see some of my tonalist paintings, uh, not just the studies I've done after the masters, uh, go to my website, which is landscapepainter.co.nz, and uh, there's quite a bit of my work there. Thanks for joining me today. Uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Meanwhile, stay out of trouble and take care.